I've been a pastor for 41 years. And in those years, the more I teach the Word of God, the more I learn from the Word of God. You know, I may have gone to college to learn the Bible, but the truth is, it was my college experience that helped me learn how to study the Bible. I really, really only learned a small portion of my education while I was being formally trained in school. Uh, my education really began after I graduated and I began pastoring and, and, and serving churches and, and understanding more about God's Word. Today's lesson, I think, really accentuates that. It accentuates the power and the value of God's Word to the believer. Uh, it's difficult for us to stay clean today when everything around us seems to be polluted. Our thought life, our television sets, the internet, even the newspapers, it's just filled with all sorts of ideas that are really contrary or opposite to what the Word of God teaches. I want us to begin looking in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13, and we're going to read down through verse 21, and, and we're going to look at the power of being able to stay clean in a polluted world. So let's look and see what God's Word says. Today I'm going to read out of the uh, New King James Version. It says, Therefore gird up the loins of your mind and be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Come as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust as in your ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all of your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges each according to each one's work, Conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by the tradition from your fathers, but you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed foreordained before the foundation of the world, but he was manifest or revealed in these last times to you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. So we want to look at that faith and, and, and that hope today. And you know, in the first section uh, of this chapter, whenever we began studying the book of 1 Peter, Peter encourages us to walk in hope. But now in today's lesson, we are seeing a shift in what the scripture is teaching. He's telling us now to walk in holiness. Well, doesn't that really describe uh, the way you come to Christ you come to Christ and, and you don't have all of the answers of life figured out. You just have this hope in you that Jesus Christ is that answer. And so we respond to God in hope. And, and we respond, it's just like the illustration that I used. Uh, I really began receiving my education after I graduated from college and I became a pastor. It was then I really started learning the scriptures as I began to apply them to my daily life. Now, I became a Christian at the age of seven, so you can imagine whenever I went down to the altar at a, a revival service that my dad was preaching, you can imagine as I stepped forward that day as a seven-year-old boy, there was really very little I knew about the scriptures. And so there was this process of learning the scriptures. But whenever I graduated from uh, college, it was then that I really began seeing the difference of walking in hope and walking in holiness. 
Whenever we come to Jesus Christ initially as our Savior, we walk in hope. But as we grow in faith and as we learn from God's Word, we begin learning how to walk in holiness. And, and we even come to understand that walking in holiness is even a bigger task than following the Ten Commandments. Now, you would think that uh, if you could teach a 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12-year-old boy, uh, if you could teach that boy how uh, to follow the Ten Commandments, Yes, that would be a lesson of walking in holiness. If you follow those commandments, you are uh, walking toward the holiness of God. But the truth is, as we grow older, we understand that there are some other things in our lives that we need to conquer. You know, we need to conquer our pride. Uh, sometimes, uh, uh, there, I, I've, I've even known of preachers who needed to conquer an element of their humility. Um, and, and, and what I mean by that is that uh, they had not learned the confidence of operating in the power of the Holy Spirit of God. They believed the Bible. They were humble before other people, but they were actually um, uh, living a life of humility to the point that, that they, they couldn't lead they couldn't lead somebody effectively to the Savior uh, because of their uh, perception of themselves. So we walk in holiness so that we come to understand what God expects. Whenever we walk in holiness and we have the attitude of Jesus Christ, we begin learning how to be bold in those instances where Christ would have been bold. And then we also learn how to be humble and subject ourselves to service, for the service, for the benefit of others, and for the glory of God. So we come to understand that as, as we go through the scriptures and as we learn the two. So Peter encouraged walking in hope, and now he's encouraging that we walk in holiness. And that's because the two go together. In 1 John, we dealt with this just uh, a number of weeks ago. In 1 John 3, 3, we read these words. For every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. So uh, every man that has this hope in Jesus, that purification process begins there because Jesus himself was pure. He lived a sinless life, and although you and I are not perfect, we are perfected through him. Now, the word holy here in this passage of scripture, it's translated and, and it effectively means different. Not odd, just different. So a Christian is to have a quality about his or her life that's different. Uh, their lifestyle after they come to Christ is different. It's, it's different from their past lifestyle. And so uh, it's different from the lifestyle of those who do not believe. And so uh, we recognize the fact that it is not always easy to live in this world and maintain a holy life. You know, it's not easy to do that all of the time. You know, the world is always doing something to press up against us, trying to get us, to, to, trying to squeeze us uh, into its mold. So, so that's what the world will, will do, trying to get us to conform. So here in this passage of, of scriptures, Peter is giving us some instructions regarding holiness and how to live a holy life. Let's look first at verse uh, 15, and, and I chose to read out of the New King James, both the New King James and the King James Version. Uh, it, it says something that, that it, at first it sounds difficult uh, uh, to understand, and so it says there, gird up the loins of your mind. Well, in the New International Version, uh, it, it just reads simply this. It just tells us to prepare our minds. 
So prepare our minds for action. But the idea of girding up, it, it's, uh, it's the idea of pulling something up. It's an idea of uh, tightening something up. And so the idea here is pull your thoughts together. So understand what those holy thoughts are those type of thoughts that are pleasing to God, the manner of thinking that honors God in our mind, pull that together and prepare ourselves. So in other words, it's an intentional act that requires some effort on the part of your mind. So uh, you not only um, uh, live and try to think pure thoughts, but those thoughts that are holy, you try to gather them and pull them up together. And so uh, then that passage of Scripture also teaches us to be sober. And in this case, it simply means keep a clear mind. Don't allow your thoughts to be um, impacted by anything that's inappropriate. So uh, keep a clear mind so that you can concentrate on pure thoughts. And, and then that passage went on to teach us that we needed to hope for the manifestation or the revelation of Jesus Christ. So we actually need to long for the appearing of Jesus Christ, his second coming. You know, few people today talk about the second coming. And, uh, and even less people hope for the second coming. So when are we more often to talk about the second coming? We're more often to talk about the second coming when trouble comes. Have you noticed that? Have you noticed that? I, I want you to think about this pandemic that we're going through right now. Over the past uh, eight months, I have heard more talk, both on television uh, and in conversation, I have heard more talk about the second coming uh, as a result of this strife that's continuing to go on uh, in, our, uh, in our world today. Now, there will be a day that Jesus Christ will intervene. There will be a day that he will come back and he will <clears throat> straighten out the evil in this world once and for all. But I also want you to recognize something that church history records for us. Not only church history in the church, uh, uh, back in the Bible days, but also church history that has been recorded, you know, since 200, 400 A.D., uh, 1000 A.D., 1600 A.D., and, and even on up to our modern days. You know, the greatest changes in the church, if you'll study church history, the greatest changes have come as a result of conflict, as a result of reaction to conflict. Some of those changes in the church that were the result of conflict, some of those changes were good changes, and some were not. Some of the changes were an action of cowering down to the conflict. But Christians live in the future tense. Whenever we accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, we do so because we want to go to heaven in our future. But by the same token, our present actions and our decisions are governed by this future hope. You know, it's amazing to me that in my sermon uh, this past Sunday, I shared a, a quote and phrase that I recognized as having come uh, from John Maxwell and Stan Toller, and, and that was the phrase, uh, outlook determines outcome. And, and uh, you know, John Maxwell and Stan Toller both uh, have been uh, incredible positive influences to the actions of the church. Well, uh, today I read those words and they came from Pastor Warren Wiersbe, who has long since gone on to be with the Lord. But uh, so this is such a popular thought. Uh, 
and, and I even read it again. Read it, I've read it a lot lately. Out, uh, outlook determines outcome, and attitude determines how we act or react. And so a Christian then, who is looking for the glory of God, they will have a better motivation for present obedience. So in other words, if uh, every day we are uh, praying and, and letting our Lord know that we're anxious to see him at his coming, and, and if we talk about that to the Lord, it's going to place in our hearts and minds uh, the type thinking there that motivates us to be obedient as we go through our lives each and every day. So the Christian who ignores thinking about Jesus' return is really more apt to find himself stumbling and falling far more often. Uh, let's just look at this contrast. Uh, we've also been studying on Sunday mornings about the life of Abraham. So let's contrast the life of Abraham and his nephew Lot. If we uh, uh, look at their stories as recorded in Genesis 12 and 13, and then also how the New Testament commentates on it in Hebrews chapter 11, we find out that Abraham had his eye on a heavenly city. Now, he was just traveling on earth where God told him to go, but in the moment he began traveling, he considered himself a pilgrim who was traveling. He began looking at the earth as his temporary dwelling place. Abraham had no interest in the world's real estate other than the place that God was going to show him and tell him where to settle. Now, Lot... Abraham's nephew, on the other hand, Lot had total interest in the land of this world. Lot had tasted the pleasures of the world. The Bible teaches us that while they were all down in Egypt, that Lot tasted the pleasures of the world in Egypt, and that's what caused him to gradually move to Sodom. Abraham brought blessing to his home, and by moving his family to Sodom, Lot brought judgment to his home, specifically to his wife. So the outcome there, or the outlook rather, determined the outcome in uh, each of those households. So not only should you and I have a disciplined mind, but we should also have a sober mind, and so we should have a mind, in other words, that is calm and steady and under control. Now, the fact that Jesus Christ is coming again should actually encourage us to remain calm. The fact that we believe and know and trust that Jesus is coming again and that it's to the benefit of his church, it ought to keep us calm and collected. Now, in a few weeks, we're going to be over in the fourth chapter of 1 Peter, but for now, let's look at what is said in 1 Peter 4, verse 7. Peter writes, The end of all things is near. Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. Wow. Now, now, now notice how this is an encouragement to our prayer life. Peter says the end of all things is near. Now, the people who first read Peter's words had no idea that the Lord would tarry 2,000 years. But the end of all things is near. It kind of reminds me of the parable that Jesus taught uh, whenever uh, uh, the parable in which there was a certain landowner who had a vineyard and he went away to a far land and uh, the farmers who were tending the vineyard, he sent back uh, some of his servants to, to get the rent for, at the harvest time for using the land. And so they went back, and the Bible says that these farmers, uh, they stoned one, they beat another, they killed a third, and, and then it ends up saying, last of all, he said, I will send my son 
they will reverence my son. So whenever it says here in this passage of scripture in 1 Peter uh, 4, 7, that the end is near, the end of all things is near, we need to remember that God has already sent his son, and that's the last thing that God is going to do to redeem mankind. So knowing this, we need to be clear-minded about the fact that God has already done his part to provide salvation for the world. And so we need to be self-controlled, making sure that we, are a li that we are living according to what God has already done. And so whenever we are clear-minded and self-controlled, living in accordance to what God has already done, now it prepares us to pray about our situations of that given day. So the fact that Satan is on the prowl, as Peter wrote in 1 Peter 5, 8, a matter of fact, he's out on the prowl like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And so that's another reason for us to be clear-minded, to be sober-minded. And uh, I believe we should also have an optimistic mind. Uh, the, uh, whenever it teaches us to hope to the end, uh, uh, it's simply meaning set your hope fully on Jesus Christ. So, uh, uh, Warren Wiersbe said that whenever your outlook is gloomy, try the uplook. So, uh, what, a, uh, what a popular statement. I'm sure you've heard that before. So, again, let's look at, at verses 14 and 15 now and uh, see how Peter talks about the holiness of God. So one of the things that we understand is that children just naturally inherit the nature of their parents. You know, uh, uh, we've been looking at some boyhood pictures of my dad recently, and I can even see some of my grandsons uh, uh, in those pictures. And so uh, uh, children just naturally inherit uh, things from their parents and even from their grandparents. And so God is holy. And because God is holy, it's only natural that his true children should live holy lives. In 2 Peter uh, chapter 1, verse 4, the Bible teaches us there that you and I have been partakers of the divine nature. So uh, there's a part of the divine. There's a part of the Heavenly Father that's within us uh, through the person of the Holy Spirit. And, and so this ought to reveal in us a godly nature. People ought to be able to see within my life and your life a godly nature. You see, true salvation always results in obedience. Now, there have been times, perhaps, that uh, you neglected your devotional time. There have been times, perhaps, that you neglected your prayer life. You know, there's an interesting thought here. Whenever you neglect your prayer life, and whenever you neglect your devotional time, you've got to fill that time with something. So... What do you fill your spare time with? Well, this takes us to a thought that I want you to consider. If we do not grow in Christ, and if we go through a time that because we are not growing, instead we are acting, uh, well, if I could just put it, uh, using the true sense of the word ignorance, you know, uh, uh, ignorant is that we're uninformed. And if we choose not to partake in those godly things and we become uninformed or even ignorant about certain issues of life, it's going to lead us to indulgence. It's going to lead us to satisfy the yearnings of our heart in an inappropriate way. You see, if we're not feeding the spirit, we're going to feed the flesh. We're going to do one or the other. And so uh, sometimes uh, whenever we ignore the things of God, uh, it affects our spiritual intelligence. 
it affects the good spiritual sense that we should have uh, as Christians. And, and we're going to find ourselves giving in to things around us that are not healthy for us to give in to. Uh, since we were born with a fallen nature, before we come to Christ, it's only natural for us to live fallen lives. But we're taught in chapter 1, verse 15, that God has called us by his grace. So what has he called us to do? He's called us to be different. He's called us to be holy. He's called us to look like him. He's called us to receive his son. So uh, we think about the term God's election. Whenever God chooses us, he then gives us the opportunity to choose him. And once we have been elected by God and we have chosen his election of us, now it involves responsibility on our part. And so everything we do is supposed to reflect the holiness of God. So uh, in verse 16, we read the words, it is written. Now that's a statement. It means, hey, it's been written in the scriptures before. Peter is letting his uh, readers know. He says, hey, I'm not writing this for the first time. Uh, it's already been written. And so that statement carries with it the great authority for the believer. You see, our Lord used the Word of God. Peter was using the Word of God here for his readers, but even Jesus used the Word of God. Whenever uh, Satan tempted Jesus uh, after he had fasted for 40 days, he was hungry, and he said, If you're really the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. And Jesus' statement to him was, It is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So think about the power of those words. It is written. It is written. Whenever we think of the Word of God, the Word of God is compared to a light. Uh, we see this in 2 Peter 1.19. We see this in uh, Psalm 119.105. There are other passages where the Word of God is compared to a, a, as a light. The Word of God is also compared to food. Uh, Jesus said again in Matthew 4.4, 4, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And, and, and so the Word of God is a reference for food as well. The Word of God is referred to as water that washes us. The Word of God is also referred to as a sword through which we can protect ourselves. We can protect ourselves from spiritual enemies with the Word of God. And one of the reasons we can do this is because the Word reveals God's mind. If we want to know how God thinks, look at His Word. Uh, we need to be learning the Word of God because it teaches us what God is thinking. It reveals God's heart, and so we should love it, and it reveals God's will, so we should live it. Uh, we do not study the Bible just to get to know the Bible better. You see, that's the roadblock for many people who are wanting to become better Christians. We do not study the Bible to get to know the Bible better. We study the Bible to get to know God better. And whenever we study the Bible with that intent, uh, that becomes our results. Now, of course, God also speaks to us in verse 17 through Peter. And, uh, and we see that uh, God will judge. We, we read about the judgment of God. Let's look again at verse 17. And if you call on the Father who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear. So uh, the word fear there, it really denotes a, a, uh, an act of reverence, 
And uh, we do know that uh, John taught us that perfect love casts out fear. But, uh, uh, you know, from day one, I loved my father. But because I grew up in a day and in a generation to where uh, parents spanked their children, you know, if I transgressed my father's will, my earthly father's will, there was an element of fear there for the discipline that was going to come along with that. And, uh, and we ought to understand that in the scriptures as well. So we need to recognize God's judgment with fear. Uh, and, and I think the intent in all of this is we need to become more serious about sin. We need to become more serious about holy living. And so uh, whenever we live our lives with that respectful fear, we will be less apt to compromise our lives with sin. So we know that God is merciful. We know that God is forgiving. But God is also a loving disciplinarian, and he will not permit his children to enjoy sin. After all, it was sin that sent his only begotten son to the cross. So if we call God our Heavenly Father, if we call God our Father, then we need to reflect his nature. So we're also told, and I read just a minute ago, that we are going to give an account for everything we've said, everything that we've done. Uh, now, I believe that everything will be singled out, even whenever the Christians are already taken to heaven, and then we get ready for that believer's judgment. There is a believer's judgment that will take place once Christians arrive in heaven. And, and I believe that it will uh, be beneficial to show the church that's in heaven together at that time what we have actually been saved from. And in those moments, uh, uh, we will celebrate the fact that God in his grace was greater than our sins because we trusted his son, Jesus, as our Lord and Savior. So, as you grow in the Christian life, I think that we all understand that God's going to increase our privileges and gifts, uh, but he's never going to give us the privilege to disobey and to sin. That privilege is not us. He never pampers his children. God never pampers his children or indulges them. God is no respecter of persons. Um, uh, he, he requires us all to live by the same standard, and that standard is the standard that Jesus set for us whenever he lived here on the earth. So, uh, in the King James Version, Peter uh, reminds his readers that they are, are sojourners on the earth, or they are pilgrims. They are temporary residents there. And so, we need to remember that life is too short for us to waste our lives on disobedience and sin. So, um, you know, I, I think that Peter's whole point in all of this is the way that we look at God. You know, uh, I even remember being the baseball fan that I am. Uh, there was a great baseball player who once referred to God as the great Yankee in the sky. And, uh, you know, that is being somewhat flippant, I believe, about the nature of God. Uh, for example, in the Old Testament, the Old Testament Jew so respected and so feared God that they would not even pronounce his holy name. And yet today, we speak the name of God with carelessness and irreverence. You know, we will uh, sometimes just inadvertently go, Oh God, or oh my God. And in those moments, we're not really thinking about God or we're not really praying to God. And so we've actually said those things in vanity. We've actually said those things uh, because we were not thinking. Matter of fact, that commandment, that third commandment, it really doesn't have so much to do with cussing as it does irreverence. Uh, uh, for example, it has to do with sincerity. Uh, that uh, it says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Well, if we were to strip down those English words, it simply means you shouldn't take God's name and treat it 
as if it were nothing. Uh, one day, uh, Kathy was at work, and one of her supervisors uh, uh, said, Jesus Christ. And so, uh, so somebody in the room said something, and he eventually asked uh, Kathy, he says, what's so wrong with saying that? He said, I go to church. He said, what's so wrong with saying that? He said, I didn't mean anything by it. And, uh, and Kathy was able to say to him, well, that's the very reason it was wrong. Because you didn't mean anything by it. That's why it was wrong. That's why it was disrespectful. I'm so glad that we have the love of God to lean on. Let's look once again, verses 19 through 21. It teaches us that we were redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And all of this was planned and foreordained before the foundation of the world. God knew. God knew that his uh, followers would, uh, would be sinful and, and, and that they would need a Savior. So he responded, not with wrath, but with love, to give us a second chance through Jesus Christ our Lord. I'm so glad he shared that love with us. I thank you so much for joining me today in our Bible study. I hope you've gotten a lot out of this today. I can't wait, for share, wait to share with you again next week. God bless you.